My assignment for today is to speak about the what, where, when, and why of international human rights, or in other words, the philosophical, historical, and political origins of human rights. In approaching this, I wish to also emphasize the importance of being attentive to critical voices, critical perspectives, what might be thought of as expressions of human rights skepticism. This is a big agenda for a short amount of time. Let's see what we can make of it. In beginning with the question of what, as in what are human rights and when, which historical periods are we speaking about, I'd like to introduce an observation that perhaps is so obvious that we fail to even notice it or at least to reflect on its full significance. Human rights today confront us in the form of international law. When we think and speak about human rights, we're thinking and speaking about standards of law. This doesn't go without saying. It wasn't always like that. Throughout history, human rights or ideas similar to the contemporary notion of human rights were articulated first and foremost as moral principles, moral norms. Norms for how human beings should interact, treat one another, and how society should treat its members, in particular, those most vulnerable and in need of protection. One can find examples of this in most, if not all, cultural traditions of the world, in all great world religions. Religions, moreover, typically contain doctrines having to do with the nature of the human being, the sanctity of life, and in many cases, the dignity, the inherent dignity of the human person. Religions also are associated with ideas about the organization of society and what constitutes requirements of justice. At various points in history, human rights have been approached as philosophical ideas. In the Western tradition, one sees examples of this already in antiquity with notions of natural law and natural rights. These were in turn taken up in the Enlightenment era by thinkers like Locke, Rousseau and Kant, who linked the idea of natural rights with a social contract theory that in turn is often seen as a kind of precursor to the contemporary uh, human rights framework. At certain points in history, human rights have been articulated as political claims. This was a central theme in the French Revolution and the American Declaration of Independence where the focus primarily was on establishing the equality of all citizens before the law and a range of associated liberties. In the 19th century, a number of social movements have successfully established particular human rights claims. This is true of the anti-slavery movement, the movement for universal suffrage, labor rights movements, establishing uh, minimum wage provisions, minimum working hours, safe working conditions, and a variety of other uh, social and economic rights movements as well. When successful, claims of this nature have been taken up and enshrined in legislation at national level and sometimes even been protected by uh, constitutional law. These developments are all highly interesting and very relevant to our present topic. But, to use a slightly awkward phrase, one might think of them as pertaining to the prehistory of human rights. The history of human rights, in the contemporary sense, the standards of international law, begins around the middle of the 20th century. There are few antecedents to this. Examples of ILO treaties, for example, establishing international uh, standards for labor rights protections. But by and large, it's a process that set in motion in the aftermath of the Second World War with the establishment of the United Nations and the adoption of the UN Charter. In 1946, a Commission on Human Rights was mandated to elaborate the reference to human rights in the UN Charter and on this basis draft a, a Universal Human Rights Treaty for adoption by the United Nations. Initially, this led to the presentation and adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, 
And following this, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and into the uh, present millennium, a range of human rights treaties have been elaborated and adopted. The center of this are the two covenants from 1966, which together with the UDHR form the Universal Bill of Rights, but also a number of specialized treaties. There's a similar development and process at regional level in several regions of the world. This indeed is the exact focus of the present course, to develop a comprehension, understanding and perspective on the standards and mechanisms of human rights law in the United Nations framework and at regional level. Our question here is to reflect on what does it mean to pre present, to articulate human rights as principles of international law. In a structural sense, this generates obligations in two different directions. Human rights treaties establish obligations of the government vis-à-vis -vis the citizens of a given country or people inhabiting the territory. At the same time, a human rights treaty establishes obligations of any state party towards other states who are parties to the treaty, so intergovernmental obligations. This is the nature of uh, international law. And Expanding from that, in a wider sense, the human rights legal framework establishes obligations of all states towards the international community at large. In this way, human rights standards emerge as core principles of international law, central focal point of international relations, and a focal point of politics of governance at national level. Human rights treaties establish the way in which a country is managed and run, not just as a domestic concern, but a concern in general for the international community. This is a principle that has gradually been articulated and accepted in the decades following the Second World War, and has now reached a point of quite wide acceptance, even to the point of thinking of the protection of human rights as not just a legitimate concern, but also a responsibility for the international community. This is, of course, a contested idea or a contested principle that is sometimes met with uh, opposition by advocates of a stronger emphasis on national sovereignty. When the drive to articulate uh, an international legal framework um, centered around human rights law and human rights standards, was launched uh, in the, in the mid-1940s, this was very closely associated with the idea of making a new beginning. The historian Marianne Glendon uh, gives a beautiful description of this in her, uh, in her book about the drafting and adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which with, has the evocative title, A World Made New. Um, there was a sense of common purpose. This captures a sense of common purpose, of rejuvenating the world, of building a new and better world uh, from the ashes of the war, from the ashes and destruction of the war. A similar sense or drive towards rejuvenation has characterized subsequent decades, in particular the 1960s, when, the, um, when newly liberated uh, nations, or newly established nations, liberated after decades or centuries of colonialism, set in motion uh, a drive to create a just uh, and inclusive post-colonial world order. Um, similarly, in the 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, there was a general rediscovery of the importance of international human rights law as a means to tackle a range of problems of fundamental concern to an interdependent international community. In all of these cases, the reference to human rights is linked intrinsically with the idea of developing and, and establishing rule of law at um, international level. This is an idea, an aspiration, that was articulated philosophically as far back as the 18th century and is now in 
being put into practice, for better and for worse.